Hello, everyone. Today we have a, a special guest, a very special guest, uh, Eric Meisel, uh, with us. And um, he is the author of uh, uh, the book Redesign Your Mind, the Breakthrough Program for Real Cognitive Change and many other books, but we're going to uh, start off our, our discussion on that book. But before we do, I'd like you to briefly introduce yourself, and then I have some other things to, to add on to that. So welcome to Arash's World, and um, please introduce yourself in any way you see fit. Sure, Harash. It's great, great to be with you. Um, I'm a retired family therapist and an active creativity coach. I've been working with creating performing artists as a coach for 30, 35 years now. I've been interested in, in their particular issues, whether it's creativity and depression, creativity and anxiety, creativity and addiction, all of the real things that creative folks face. I've also been interested in cognitive behavioral therapy, in cognitive thought, and in trying to move cognitive therapy forward a little bit. And that's what uh, this book is about. It's trying to move away from the idea of just arm wrestling thoughts, no longer just thought blocking or thought stopping, but actually changing the source of the thoughts so that those thoughts that we don't want don't even bother to arise. So that's the point of this book. As you mentioned, I've done a lot of books. I've done maybe 50 books and many are in the creativity field. Many are also in the mental health field I'm in what's called the critical psychology field, where we dispute the mental disorder paradigm, the current paradigm. We don't really believe in the way the American Psychiatric Association defines mental disorders. That's a big subject, but it connects to my belief that there isn't really such a thing as therapy. That's why I don't really wanna talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, but rather simple ideas about cognitions, how the mind works, and ideas related to that. Well, that's wonderful. You have written over 50 books and that's five zero. That's a lot of books. And I think just uh, for myself, just like getting one done is, is, is a lot of work. And it's not just the, an issue of discipline. I think it's like also passion and compassion. I think those are driving forces to, to, to get going for a book. Would you agree with that? That there needs to be both of these things involved to, to write as many books as you do. <clears throat> Absolutely. Pavarotti has a quote I like, which is people say I'm disciplined, but it's not discipline, it's devotion. And there's a big difference. So you call it passion, it could be love, devotion, something in addition to discipline is needed, because you can't really white knuckle a book. It's too much work to just sit there in a disciplined way and write a book, we need this thing that you're calling passion. And I think it connects to us falling in love with some art form at the age of five or six or seven. It's that experience of being a little kid sitting in a corner reading a book. I think that's where the love of writing and books comes from. It comes from that early age. And we never quite get over that, nor should we get over that. That's, a, that's something to cherish and enjoy. But I think if we've fallen in love with books, if we've had that experience, then we wanna do that for the next person. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, that's the love and passion. It's to provide that, it's the reading experience for the next person. So we do need both discipline and devotion. And you, you, you feel it. I mean, I feel it as a reader going through your book. It's fun and engaging. And so having a psychology book to be fun and engaging is, is a great feat. And it's, it's, it's really well done. I, I especially like many of, of your ideas here and your approach to, um, to bringing about change. Now, your, your subtitle includes real cognitive change. And so I, I, I agree with that. And I think like... Um, I myself uh, am a bit of a critic of, of CBT as, as an approach because I think it's like often does not go deep enough to deal with yep. that change. But uh, reading your book, I, I'm seeing that you're moving it in, in another direction, which is really close to my direction, how I see it with the ideas about visualization, imagination, mindfulness, and including emotions as well, because the, the problem with, with the cognitive approach is at the expense of emotions often, or the idea of also positive thinking. It's like, okay, well, that's more thinking. And what if the thought itself is a problem? Yeah. So, and you're mentioning all of these things in your book. And just to, yeah. to start off with, and then uh, I'd love to have uh, uh, a deeper discussion on all of these things as well. But 
you are talking about basically redesigning our mind room. And I love that expression, mind room, of changing it to make it different, basically to renovate it, to change the wallpapers, to add uh, yeah. light switches and so on. That's, that's very creative. That's, that's really interesting. And um, we are stuck in many, like we're stuck in stuffy rooms in many cases. We just repeat the same thought patterns in many cases. And it wow. occurred to me once, and uh, this was before reading your book, but it fits in perfectly, that I am often trapped in my own ways of thinking. And the idea of thinking outside of the box is like changing our point of view, seeing something in a different way. And that is so enriching, but it, often we get trapped in that cycle. So maybe can you talk about opening the windows here to our stuffy mind rooms? And what could you add to that? Sure, let, let's, let's begin at the beginning here. And that is with the idea of visualization. Uh, visualization came about as an idea, as a technique 30, 40 years ago, and it started in a hospital in Northern California where somebody dreamed up the idea of having cancer patients visualize their healthy cells defeating their cancerous cells. That's the genesis of visualization. And we all believe and agree that there's a mind-body connection. We don't know what it is precisely, but we know there has to be a connection. So this is a way, visualization is a way of using your mind to make the changes that you want to make. The running metaphor in the book is that you can go to the room that is your mind. And I think that's actually how we experience the mind sometimes as a room that we go to. Descartes pictured it as a stage, which is another interesting image. I'm just choosing to do room because that's that has some functionality to think of it that way. It's also more personal. I like that more because I can relate to it more. Stages in front of others, but room is really exactly. my own. Yes. So one thinks of the room that is one's mind as a place, thinks of going there, and thinks of making changes that make sense. <clears throat> changes that are useful. You've mentioned some of them already. If it feels claustrophobic in there, then you would visualize installing windows and let a nice fresh breeze blow through. If you're always sad when you get there, many people, the second they start to think about something are a little bit overwhelmed by sadness over what's going on in the world and this, that, and the other thing. So if you are sad, then you would Repaint those dingy walls a bright color or put up some wallpaper. These are visualizations that you can do in a split second. And they actually cause some different feeling in the being as well as some changes in perception. They do that. Some other ideas are, and this is a big one, many people are down on themselves. So my metaphor for that is to remove the bed of nails in your mind room and replace it with an easy chair. It's a very powerful switch. If you were, if a person were to actually visualize getting rid of that bed of nails and introducing an easy chair, I, I think people instantly feel that difference. Absolutely. And the bed of nails is something I do want to quickly comment on as well. I think everyone has a bed of nails. Sometimes we might even have more than one. Yeah. And so, <laughs> um, and it's sometimes hidden. And I, I like how you're also talking about the past and uh, the trauma that is inherited uh, that we take over. We're not blank slates. We are like mm -hmm. things that happen to us and our genetics and, and experiences and so on. But why is there a bed of nails? Why do we all have one? And I think if you say you don't have one or many people, I think they're, they're deluding themselves because it, there is something that is causing discomfort in, in, in most of our lives, I think, and in most people's lives. I think it's pretty straightforward. I and mean, we could say it in many different ways, but all of us have failed a million times over. And they're mm -hmm. trivial failures often. So we got a C plus rather than a B minus on, on an exam somewhere. But we take that in somewhere and we are self-critical. I remember an actor once saying that for every 50 positive notices he gets, it's the one negative notice that, that matters. That the 50 positive ones have no particular effect. He doesn't even, they don't even 
they don't they don't go anywhere <laughs> and, and it's uh, it comes from evolution i think because when you uh, pass that road like nine times and nothing happens but the tenth time you get attacked by a tiger you say okay well it's 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 dangerous and we kind of like um i think in, inherit that in a way of, of seeing it in that way a failure is it seems like to, to be the worst thing that could happen to us yeah, and we and take it very personally on, yeah. well, let's go in another direction also while we're mm -hmm. talking about this because this is another area of interest to me mm -hmm. So I've always been interested in the authoritarian personality, which is a phrase that arose in the 1950s out of the work of UC Berkeley researchers led by Adorno. And they wanted to know not so much who Hitler was, but who Hitler's followers were. This was in the aftermath of World War II and they, everyone was trying to figure out why did so many people follow Hitler? And this is of course relevant stuff to us today. But so the authoritarian personality literature grew up, but it always looked at political and social movements and not at families. And so I started looking at authoritarians in the family, did a book on that authoritarian wounding, did a lot of research on that. And if you take, these are not real statistics because no one have done, no one has done studies, but the people who write in this field have the feeling that maybe as much as 25% of the population are authoritarian, meaning cruel and bullying and punishing. In other words, we could use- And lacking empathy in many of those cases. Lacking empathy, yeah. some combination of intrusiveness and narcissism and this, that, and the other thing. We could draw the picture. But if 25% of the population is authoritarian by nature or authoritarian by formation, then virtually everybody is going to have, it's going to, have to bear the brunt of an authoritarian whether it's a father, mother, sibling, or someone at work or a coach or here or there. So that creates, that further creates the bed of nails. If somebody has been cruel to you and punishing you your whole life, the, the psych word for that is it get, that gets interjected. You, you then become the self punisher and you punish yourself. And that is what happens. That's, that's the lifelong consequence of being an authoritarian family is that you're going to punish yourself by marrying an authoritarian, or we could name all the ways, succumbing to an addiction, not feeling competent. There are a million consequences of growing up in an authoritarian family. So that's all by way of saying, we, we could say it in all kinds of different ways. That bed of nails is there for everybody pretty much. Maybe yes. sharper for some people, less sharp for other people. You said another thing, if I may just piggyback sure. for a second about nature, the nature nurture distinction. Um, I think personality is made up of three parts, original personality, formed personality and available personality. It's, it, it's a pretty robust, simple model. Psychology is not interested in original personality. It's a big flaw of psychology. They do not act as if we come into the world already ourselves, already somebody. Anybody who's had kittens or puppies or kids knows that every creature comes into the world already itself, more curious or less curious, smarter or less smart, more sensitive or less sensitive. So if you were, just to take one example, if you were to come into the world a little sadder than the next person, that's not a mental disorder, but it is a lifelong challenge. It's not going away. It's something that we're going to have to deal with our whole life long. So it, it's an important distinction between original personality and form personality. If something is part of our original nature, it ain't going away. And we have to take, we have to address it. We have to deal with it as a lifelong, just, just as a chronic personality challenge that we have to deal with. And so when, when we look at slates that are written, you can still write on them too, to a large degree as well. So even though it, in many ways, it comes like with a certain personality, but you can, to an extent, and again, it depends case by case, but you can adjust it, you can modify it. And I think like epigenetics and neuroplasticity are showing that there is the chance of redecorating our mind. Of I was wondering also, if, if you feel like you're in a prison, can you also relocate? Would you, would you use that? Relocate your room and just say, you know what, I want my room in a different place. Would you take that metaphor like a bit uh, further too? Or would you say, no, there are certain limits? I've just been writing about that in, in, in a blog post about mind as prison. And my transformation for that was a little different from yours about relocating. Mine was to transform the cell into a monk's cell. 
to still use the word sell, but but do that trans transformative work. So you because actually, if you think about it, medieval monks and prisoners were in about the same space, but they had different experiences. One had one was in a sacred space, maybe writing, maybe drawing an illuminated manuscript, and but it was the same dark walled place. So I think even if we didn't change the physical space too much, if the cell were still a cell, we could completely change its orientation, so to speak, or the way it feels by A, removing the bars, B, being able to get out. I mean, a monk could go to breakfast, so we, we can get out. But also having the experience inside there be that passionate experience you were talking about before of writing your novel there or praising God or whatever it is that is your is your devotional aspect. So that's all by way of saying I agree. And let me continue a little bit. For me, that third part, available personality, is what you were talking about a moment ago. And that's how remaining for, that's our ability to rewrite our messages and, and, and redecorate and all of that. And for me, it's a kind of amount. I almost see available personality as an amount that changes depending on how we're living our life. For instance, if you're an addict, you don't have that much available personality if you're rushing around all day looking for a fix. The, the second you enter recovery, even if it's very early recovery and tenuous recovery, the second you enter recovery, you have more personality available. That amount has grown. I think it's an interesting way to think about freedom that freedom as a kind of amount that can change, and we can grow that amount by how we live our lives. I love that. And there are just so many thoughts that are coming that I want to share as well, and then previous things. So just the idea of like, uh, I think it was in Hamlet where he says, king be a king in a nutshell. So you're a nutshell and you feel yourself uh, as a king. And what impressed me with Nelson Mandela is where he didn't feel like he said, yes, this may be a prison, but I feel free. And that kind of like mental freedom, the free mind room, where you know you are doing the right thing. And uh, Terrence Malick had a movie about this Austrian deserter who gets uh, um, arrested during World War II because he didn't do the Hitler salute and um, and he's taken away and he's like his his village hates him and they're they're haunting uh, they're uh, harassing his family his children but he's uh, st he sticks to his principles and says I'm not going to do this so this this Nazi uh, officer comes and talks to him and it's like you know what you're in prison and he says no I'm not I'm actually free and the prison is out there and it just moved me so much because it's sometimes our definition of, of prison. It's it's not the physical place. It's really the mind. And so uh, that yeah. liberty is, is so let's, important. Let's, let's play with that for a second, because there's mm -hmm. another related metaphor or image that I think is useful here. Not a prison, but a, but, but a resistance cell. It's a similar idea. I grew up I was born right after World War II. I grew up in a Brooklyn neighborhood with uh, concentration camp survivors with the tattoos on their forearms. And, and World War II was the main thing on our minds in, in the 50s, apart from maybe nuclear destruction also. But World War II was still the main thing. And so the idea of being a resistance fighter was very important to me, even as a kid, that idea maybe whatever superheroes are to kids now, that resistance fighter was my superhero place as a kid. And if you think of a resistance fighter sort of underground in a cellar somewhere, waiting to receive word from the allies to go out and blow up a bridge, he's in a prison too of a certain sort. That is, he has to stay in that cellar. He has to remain quiet, can't really move, can't really roam about town. He too is trapped, but that's not his experience of being trapped. His experience is of getting ready to do something heroic or something necessary, not heroic, but something important, something meaningful. So that's a similar feeling. He was trapped in a cellar room, but not trapped because of all this pent up potential and what he knew was coming. 
Absolutely. I, one of the, the things that I misunderstood previously about uh, positive thinking and uh, CBT as well uh, has been clarified when I uh, watched a Zoom talk uh, with uh, Martin Seligman, uh, who, oh, I mean, his, his uh, approach of learned helplessness, it's you would think like this is not positive at all. But then when he talked, it became clearer to me that it's not so much about having like positive thoughts, uh, but just an optimistic outlook, as well as agency and that is so important so when we're when we're talking about that that prison that environment that uh, that stuffy brain that we have or mind that we have agency is so important and he showed it throughout like history how agency has uh, kind of created all these movements of the French Revolution or Industrial Revolution. And it's come because people felt empowered and we can do things. And then we look outside in the world today and there's one side, we do see the agency where it's it's fluctuates, yeah, it goes up and down. And we do see the agency, but then there's others who are defeatist or who don't do anything or who are apathetic or don't care and they're indifferent. And so yeah. it's it's really a responsibility that goes with it and I'm going to take it in a completely different direction as well, is, uh, well, people who try to control us are actually not in control of themselves. That's another thing. So they are kind of enslaved uh, as well. And one thing, and I, I think you, you're doing a great job talking about that, is also the movement of atheism, of, of uh, saying, you know what, in many ways, religion is uh, limiting us. It's uh, giving us duty, obligation. The Old Testament, there is no agency in there when we follow it. The New Testament changes its tone and its perspective a bit, but that kind of idea that religion can also be restrictive in, in many ways and limiting, and that idea of, uh, of, of, of a God that we have, a traditional God. So I, I know there, there are a lot of ideas here, but feel free to pick and choose what you wanna comment on here. Well, religion is authoritarian by nature, mm -hmm. it is. And to my mind, it's a betrayal of our common humanity. It's a betrayal to act like you know what somebody wants, that there is a God who wants something of all of us is a betrayal of our common humanity. That, that, that's a way for you to feel superior to me and I don't buy it. Uh, fascists have always got, gotten into bed with the religious, whether they were believers or not. We don't believe Trump went to church, but we know that he's gonna get into bed with the religious because that serves him because they have shared ideals of punishment. So uh, to give just one little interesting example of how fascists get into bed with the religious, Mussolini was an atheist. Most smart people are atheists, I think. But Mussolini was an atheist, but he had his kids baptized in church. He called, you know, the Catholic Church the, the best thing since sliced bread. He he knew that he he would have a great ally in the Catholic Church if he would just embrace them, and they embraced each other, and it was a, a marriage made in heaven, so to speak. So don't know where else to go with that except to, to share kind of a vision of when I was growing up in Brooklyn, grew up with my mom, just the two of us. She was secular and we were Jewish, but she was secular. But it was a pretty orthodox neighborhood of Orthodox Jews and Orthodox Italian Catholics. So at those times of the week, there would be the Orthodox Jews going off to shul and the Orthodox Catholics going off to church. And at the earliest age, three, four, five, six, I just knew that was humbug. I've had this lifelong feeling of the both ridiculousness of it and the badness of it. So I'm not really going anywhere with this thought except to say I have done a book called The Atheist Way. I do write about it. I do consider myself an activist atheist, um, but that's probably it for that. <laughs> I, I love your courage and your your honesty in this, and uh, that, that's that's wonderful. And I think like it also takes us about the idea of meaning. And so when meaning is given to you and it's like this is the meaning of life, I don't think I would be able to embrace it because it is not. It's it's meaning like you say, it's something that we we create that we have to kind of create out of ourselves, out of our own being. I think like more like uh, existentialism or perhaps Buddhism where um, you find your own path and what is meaningful to you. 
Yeah, um, I've been trying to shift the paradigm from seeking meaning or finding meaning, as you just said it, to making meaning, to, to make that shift, to let go of the seeking and finding meaning, because there's nothing to find, there's nothing out there. For me, meaning is a certain kind of psychological experience. It's all it is. It's what it is, maybe not all, but it's what it is. And as a psychological experience, it naturally comes and goes like every other kind of experience, whether it's anger or love or what have you, these things come and go. So A, we should stop harboring the desire for meaning to stay put. We, don't, we shouldn't need life to feel meaningful at all times. It naturally comes and goes. B, and this is a big one for creative folks, really for all folks, but for creative folks especially, Activities in the service of meaning may not feel meaningful. And I just want to pause there for a second for that to sink in a little bit. While we're working on our novel, we may not experience that as a meaningful activity because maybe it's a, the book is sloggy or we're making mistakes or we don't like the book. Or, so we're sitting there for those two hours, but we're not experiencing it as, as meaningful. Well, that lack of the experience of meaning is going to cause a lot of people to stop working on the book. They're going to say, well, this isn't meaningful. But that's a misunderstanding. The misunderstanding is that experiences should feel meaningful. No. We should live our life purposes in the plural. There is no purpose to life. There are life purposes that we choose. We should live our life purposes. And if we get the experience of meaning out of that, that's a blessing. Meaning is not the thing to chase. We should be ethically and honorably living our life purposes. And if we get some meaning out of that, wonderful. To take as an analogy, in the days before World, in the days before D-Day, we don't care if Eisenhower is having a meaningful time of it, or whether he's depressed or whether he's anxious, we just need him to get the invasion right. We need him to do his work. And that's what we need of ourselves. We need, we need first to identify what's important to us, what our principles are, what our values are, and then do the work. And if we get the experience of meaning from that, that's wonderful, but that's just, that's just an add-on, that's just a gift. People should stop chasing the experience of meaning as if that experience were that important. What's important is that we live our life purposes. What would be the difference between motivation and meaning in, in your sense? Because I feel a bit of an overlap between motivation and meaning in, in, in your definition of it. Well, it's, it's complicated and tricky. I think we can look back at those experiences that were in fact meaningful and in a common sense way say, I wanna do them again because I got the experience of meaning out of them. So previous meaningful experiences are motivational in the sense that since we got the experience of meaning from it previously, we might get it again. Then there's kind of speculative meaning. I, I call these meaning opportunities. That is things that we don't know if they would prove meaningful or not, but we were hazarding the guess that a month in Paris might prove meaningful or this or that might prove meaningful. So we take it as an opportunity and we give it a try. And so it's motivational in that predicting sense. And then, and then, there are, then there's the idea of meaning investments. That is the idea of choosing our values, choosing our life purposes and investing in them with the hope that we'll get the experience of meaning from it. So there are different, there are different senses in which chasing meaning or thinking about meaning might be motivational. And, and meaning changes too, because things that were not, and you mentioned that in your book, things that were not meaningful to me, let's say five years ago, have gained a lot of meaning to myself. And because I've, I've entered like a, a transformational stage, four years ago, I decided to take better, uh, better care of my health and to be um, more um, uh, mindful, to be uh, appreciating life much more than before, to be less stressed, to not be driven by work and by worries and so on. So uh, when that happened, a lot of things shifted. And I noticed my, my walks in nature 
I noticed things that I hadn't seen before. And it kind of gets me to an idea because I um, slightly disagree with you. I think I disagree with you in terms of spirituality, because I think there is something out there. So just like in, in, in a way of, of uh, Buddhism, I would say, not, uh, not talking about a traditional God. And that is something that that kind of God, I would say, is pretty mean and punishes people and wants people to obey. I'm talking about like a, a loving presence and in, uh, in terms of spirituality, a connection, the universe kind of on your side. So uh, I think there is something. It's just that I don't or I didn't perceive it as much as I do now. And it's it's kind of um, uh, I, I like the idea of Buddhism, of enlightenment, of, of trying to kind of clear your mind get rid of all the bed of nails that we have, yep. re uh, redecorate whatever it is, but then also put on the correct lenses and see the world as it is, as something very beautiful, as something um, wonderful. It's a miracle. And I think we lose touch with that. And that is, in my view, the, the main problem, why people are always running around looking for meaning, why they're unhappy, because they do not connect with that self that bigger self not the ego but something that surrounds us that energy so i don't know if if you agree or disagree with any of these oh, but I, I, oh, I, I, oh i completely disagree but that's okay. fine that's uh, it that's okay yeah <laughs> i i don't i don't think uh well it's not really important to go down this path but i don't think the word spiritual has actually any meaning hmm. at all mm -hmm. uh, i think it's it's a it's a kind of word that's meant to capture a certain feeling but I don't think that, that the universe is loving. I don't think it's hating either. I don't, I think it's what it is. I don't think it's neither of those things. People can be loving, bear cubs can be loving, creatures can be loving, but I don't think the universe is loving. I don't think there's something out there mm -hmm. that is loving. So, you know, we probably just fundamentally disagree. Also, I have a belief about mystery. That is there are mysteries, but they're mysterious. And the second you give, the second one gives a commonplace ordinary answer to the mystery. Well, it's about being born on January 13th. Th those kinds of answers to deep mystery are not satisfying. I don't believe them. I believe in mystery, but I believe the mysteries are mis mysterious. And it's the answering of the mysteries that I don't like. Mm -hmm. I just think the answers given to the mysteries are trivial. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and in Buddhism, they say you cannot express it, that thing that you cannot express. And it it, it is probably yeah, then, really we try, hard. then people try to express it. <laughs> and they try because uh, we want to but communicate. You <laughs> do you not see the problem there? I do see the problem. <laughs> you and that's, can't. Yes. You can't. If, if it can't be expressed, it can't be expressed. And, and then to in the next. But it doesn't breath, mean it's not there. It may not mean it's not no something there there's stuff there uh -huh. but whatever you want to say about it is no, then trying to express it yeah yeah the best you can do is is write books and do blogs and well the best music. you can do is i think the following um even though we have multiple life purposes each of us i do think that we can come up with a life purpose statement that kind of captures our multiple life purposes for me, it's very simple, do the next right thing. And if people would do that more than caring about is the, is the universe loving or not loving or this or that, but if they would just do the next right thing, we'd all be much better off. So and for me, I think people just spend too much time looking for something and doing things that are not in the service of, of the actual next right thing but are in the service of something else, in the service of cultivating a feeling. Maybe it's a peaceful feeling. Maybe it's this kind of feeling. Maybe it's that kind of feeling. But it's not serving this arduous task of keeping the world afloat. I think creativity is hugely important to that. And I like how you're, you're, you talk about creativity as, as something like becoming like really yourself and being probably also having the courage to create something and and having confidence and faith in that and as you mentioned also creative people are are more attuned to the world but they also suffer more and they often yes. suffer from various illnesses and you have a book on van gogh who is somebody i've become very interested in myself just about his yep. life and his paintings and before it didn't like move me as much but now that i know a bit of how much he struggled 
but at the same time, how much joy he experienced. And that is, again, trying to communicate that in his paintings, in these yeah. amazing colors and so on. But it seems that we are, we are as, and I consider myself creative, and as of course you are, uh, you're a coach of, of creativity. But I think in, in a sense, we are like um, HSP people. We are a hypersensitive and uh, we see yeah. things and feel things much more strongly. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of suffering, but it's, it's same time is blessing in disguise because that that suffering that pain creates so much within us and my my best work is coming by dealing with that that suffering and I've become much freer now to express myself in many ways self-expression freedom Great. of expression and mm -hmm. all that and that is that that bit of nails that was like keeping me grounded and now I feel like I can do much more right what comes up for me is a funny anecdote. It really is off off point, but just comes up for me. And that is one of the strangest moments in Van Gogh's life. So he comes to um, Provence. But let's let's backtrack. So he's a pastor first. He tried that, yeah. He tried that. He was fired, essentially, yeah. for being too passionate. Yes. So he's fired. So he's about to commit suicide because he's at some existential extremity, probably about 28, 27. He was also and trying he, to and, follow his father's footsteps. And I think that was exactly, it. It's like blindly exactly. following it. Yeah, exactly. And then he remembers he loves painting, which saves his life at that moment. Doesn't ultimately save his life, but it saves his life at that moment. And he first goes to Paris. And in Paris, he does the following amazing thing before we get to Provence. I know we're off, but this is interesting. So in Paris, he does the following amazing thing. He can see these paintings in his mind's eye that are coming, but he knows he can't make them yet. He doesn't have the skill to make them. So he spends a full year just making marks, how to capture a pine tree in three strokes or how to capture a cypress in five strokes. He learns his craft in a way in which a contemporary person practically never does. They want to get to the product and skip the process somehow. So A, that's amazing that he didn't rush to paint. He did not rush to paint. He prepared himself, which is quite amazing. But then he did. He prepared himself. He started painting. Then he went to Provence. And here's the anecdote. What's the first thing he does in Provence? You're not going to get this unless you know it. I know. This misanthropic guy who doesn't really like people buys 12 expensive chairs to run a salon. He's got, he's got to be the last person in the world to successfully run a salon. Right? <laughs> I did not know he that. He does not like that's people. <laughs> it, it, but that speaks to the relational needs of alienated people. We, Alienated people still have their relational needs. And if they, those needs are not met, they may well still commit suicide, even if they make a million beautiful paintings. Mm -hmm. So it's so that little anecdote stands for a big point about how you must, this is my catchy phrase for it, you have to both create and relate. Both are important. If one tries to live a life just of creativity, that typically does not work because one ends up too, too cold, alone, alienated, distant and all of those things. I guess I'll just put a period there. Often we relate like extreme creativity with madness and they say the two are very close to each other. Would you agree? I mean, the definition of madness, of course, is, is debatable, but would you agree with, with that it's idea? It's more than debatable. The short yeah. answer is absolutely not. There's a woman, Judith Schlesinger, who's done an interesting book, which I would recommend called The Insanity Hoax. Mm -hmm. which is about which is all about the thing you just said about the mislabeling of genius and calling it insanity and there are big debates and conflicts here sort of a war between those who believe that mental disorders are a particular biological or chemical or hereditary thing and, and those who don't believe in that and, and don't believe in the model so this is a can of worms place, but to answer your yes, question in, in, in shorthand, no. 
<laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Now, I, I think one of the problems with psychology for me too is that it it often it's kind of like they they are like lawyers, they're counsel, like counsel. Uh, counsel. It's like defending you against insanity and uh, trying to pr to protect you from that. And we look for help when it's basically too late. It's like basically calling the plumber and say, "Well, you know what? My my toilet is overflowing." And it's the approach that has happened over the the recent years, to my knowledge, and the idea of coaches. So I don't like the term coach, but the idea of coaches is to kind of like create optimal functioning instead of yeah. just functioning. And I like that. And I think we need more of that. So to make sure not that everybody's just barely fine, but that everybody's yeah. thriving. And uh, yeah. that is the, the movement. I would call it maybe self-actualizing, like just kind of sure. like it's, mass it's, it's and an outgrowth of the human potential. Movement. And I think Absolutely. that's really important, but we're focusing in terms of psychology is only when there's a problem, I will go and contact you just like our medical professions. And I think yeah. it's completely different though. It's a, it's, it's a realm on its own. Yeah, plus um, why, why should we call Despairing because we hate our boss, our wife, and our life, a mental disorder. Hmm. We have our reasons for mm -hmm. hating our life, and we're down. It's not a mental disorder. It's a consequence of certain nameable things. And the answer to hating your boss can't be a pill any more than it can be scotch or marijuana or heroin. It, the answer to hating your boss can't be a pill. 100%. It's a category mistake. Yes, 100% <laughs> agree with you on that, yes. And uh, I, I think for me, what has really helped is has been the uh, idea of, of Freud, of really looking for the, the what is causing this? Why is this happening? The question why has always been, I've been fascinated with it as a teen, as, as a, I started reading philosophy, because I was like, I want to know why. And once you figure out that why, you get to the source of the problem, it fixes a lot of things. I find out why I hate that boss. I find out why I hate this person, why I react in this way. And it's to me, it's kind of, it's insight of gaining insight into who you are and what caused those feelings. And, yeah. and what I slightly disagree with in your book is the idea of emotional release, uh, the way you're, you're talking about it. Because for me, it's emotional release is be aware of it, let it flow out and just let it uh, dissolve. And uh, it takes a lot of effort. You need to go through all those emotions. If you had trauma, you need to go through that dark place. There are places you have to walk through, face those inner demons. But then once they dissolve, you feel liberated. And that boss cannot uh, scare you anymore, does not have control anymore. So you become more, um, you gain more agency that way. You become freer, more liberated. And I it's not something that we can simply do, though. It's yeah. like, uh, no, no, it, it's it's, it takes a lot of effort. I agree. I agree. By the way, just parenthetically, um, something that you know, because I work with lots of writers, this comes up for memoirists all the time, and it's the need to be able to deal with old material but not be overwhelmed by it or harmed by it in the present moment. In the PTSD literature, there's a phrase, the idea of uh, remembering something without re-experiencing it. Um, and so that's an interesting skill, let's call it, or place to arrive at, whatever to call it, a place to arrive at where you can go back in memory to the trauma for the sake of describing it for your memoir, but not having to re-experience it. So it doesn't really connect to anything you were saying, but it just popped into my head as, as, a, as a difference between, I, that there's a difference. But it's still gonna be there if, if you don't go through the motions, you right. know? And, and that's something that I've discovered and it's, it's, it's difficult, it's painful, but it's so rewarding. And I think when, if we face the, that, those bed of nails and we actively say, okay, I'm gonna lie down on it, I'm gonna feel it, mm -hmm. it kind of disappears and turns into, into a comfortable bed. And so and that has been my experience. And by the way, just uh, talking about uh, easy chairs and so on, I, I've just bought uh, a chair after reading your book and it's gonna <laughs> arrive any moment today. And I said, I deserve a better chair. And that just kind of that's, physical that's room that, yeah. we, that we change as well, the physical and the spiritual, if, uh, for lack of a better word. That's, that's absolutely right. Because the things that we do 
in our mind room, we then might want to do in real, we might want to paint our walls a brighter color. We might want to do X and Y. Yeah. So th that's right. There's a natural relationship between being able to do something in an instant in our mind's eye and then deciding to do that thing for real in the real world. For instance, let me just play with this idea for a second. I invite people to install a speaker's corner. I think everyone knows about the speaker's corner in Hyde Park in London, which has been there for centuries. And it's a place where you can freely say what's on your mind without fear of being arrested. And there actually are um, speaker's corners in many parts of the world. There are probably 20 or 30 different speaker's corners around the world. Well, we need one in our mind because people keep the truth from themselves. They don't speak the truth to themselves. We call it whatever self-censorship or different ways of saying it. It was one of actually Freud's pet ideas about self-censorship. Mm -hmm. And so if you are stuck with the problem of self-censorship, well, then you need a speaker's corner where you can go into that corner and say what's on your mind safely. Well, that's just in your mind. So then you get to decide, do I want to say that out in the real world? Do I want to say that thing to my husband or my wife or my boss? Do I want to say that thing? In the... So there's this movement from the work that we do in our, in a way it's like rehearsal. We go to our speaker's corner, we rehearse what we need to say. Then we decide if we want to say it in the real world or not. I believe that uh, that has helped athletes as well when to visualize a specific yep. sport. And then when they actually engage in it, they do better because they are ready for it. They experienced it in many ways. So I like the word rehearsal. And I think in some ways, if, if you can't do it, it's good to do it to yourself and being completely honest and truthful and just kind of stated, accepted. I feel this way. I want to say this but maybe not going on social media or saying to, to the person, if it is, again, something that would create more conflict, well, but it's still a relief of releasing yeah. it. Yeah. Rehearsal is really, really important because people get stuck in life, badly stuck, because they haven't thought through how to respond to X, Y, or Z. And by not knowing how to respond, they don't do it. Mm -hmm. So rather than thinking through the 12 questions a literary agent can ask you, there are only a dozen, rather than thinking it through and having preparing your answers for that, they never get in touch with a literary agent because they don't feel prepared. So this, this act of rehearsing and predicting and get, getting your talking points, getting your answers to the questions you might be asked in life is really important. And if we don't get in that habit, we're much more likely not to get our real work done. Absolutely. One, uh, one of the things that has really helped me in, uh, in these interviews, for these interviews, as well as in, in my life in teaching, has been improv. And I, I tried improv theater and just the idea of I have to respond quickly. And I, if, if you want yep. to be funny, it's all about timing, because if you say your joke five minutes later, it won't work. So yep. that kind of confidence we gain through that. Yeah. It's helped my teaching someone, and it's helped my interviews. Yeah. Me, someone just reminded me the other day of that show, Whose Line Is It yeah, Anyway? I love that. Yes. Isn't that a great show? That's yeah. that's like the, 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 the top top level. Got to be smart to do that. that that's, the, that's the top level improv. And it's confidence, the confidence that I guess yes. that can be funny and, and you try it out and okay, the jokes, not all of them will land, but we, we just gain that, that confidence and respond yeah, to and the you know, moment, the situation. That, that yeah. is a, that's an aspect of creativity that folks tend not to understand that well, that notion of conversion thinking, the idea of putting disparate things together into a new thing, for instance, Think of a salmon, you think of a skyscraper. A kid will a kid can make a salmon-shaped skyscraper easily on paper and in, in her mind's eye. Adults don't want to stick them together. We're so used to keeping things discrete, keeping the salmon in the refrigerator and the skyscraper out on the street, that we can't put those things together. And that, that's part of what that's that is divergent thinking, is getting them together into, into a new salmon-shaped skyscraper. But that's also what improv can do for us. It's pulling this thing from over there mm -hmm. and this thing from over there and sticking them together in this absurd way that's interesting to the listener. But it's, it's the epitome of being creative. 
I, I think I read somewhere, I don't remember when, I, and I've read a lot of books, so it gets confusing, but that creativity is basically things that you've experienced and you, you are reassembling them. So it's not that like you're not creating something new, it's just you're using those blocks to do something else. And I teach languages and I tell, you know what, I give you the Lego blocks, blocks and you create your own building yeah. or whatever shape you want to create. And I think to me, that kind of makes sense. And improv is that where you take this and I saw this program and I'm taking this idea put it together and you create something beautiful or funny or interesting yeah and you know and i think you're putting it together in the service of some core feelings or ideas that are that are behind you somewhere and <laughs> exactly. you said that a writer is always working on the same same three three themes from childhood whatever those three themes are and i think that's true that we there, whether it's for me even authoritarianism or world war ii or religion or keep coming back to the things that are important to me and I think that, so even if we're doing improv, I think we still know at the back, somewhere in the back of our head is, well, let me bash religion a little, or let, let me let me do something here with this improv. And I, I love to just go back and full circle and here as, as my, my final question for you, um, why did you write this book specifically at this time? Because I, I've noticed when, especially when I read people's books, it's because that is something that is important to them. There's part of them. The reason you engage in a book is because there is something that you maybe are uh, working on or struggling with or dealing with or are inspired by and what would yeah. that be for this particular book you know it, it's it's super simple and undramatic the metaphor came to me wonderful and i just liked it yeah. i could just see how much fun it would be to redesign and redecorate one's mind it, just, it was like wow that'd be wow put in windows by that it just came to me and then i wanted to pursue it because i, I liked it Exactly. Wonderful. It's, it's, it's a great book. It's a great idea. You are a wonderful person to talk to. I've so much enjoyed this. And uh, we might not see eye to eye on certain items, but again, it doesn't matter. And I think that is that is something that people are um, forget or they don't realize that we don't have to be uh, in agreement with others per, in perfect agreement. It is perfectly fine to have just different as long as, just as long as you're opinions. not just as long as you're not mean to me and I'm not mean exactly. to you. Exactly. As long as we have a, a civil discourse, but I, I very much appreciate your ideas, your book, your work, uh, your your over 50 books. I have a lot of reading to do. My reading list has <laughs> just grown exponentially. But I will start with the Van Gogh book because that is something that immediately resonated with you with me. And uh, thank you so much for, for this interview. I very much enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for, for being a guest here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you.